I'm Sonia Morton Firth, and you're tuned in to the Sonia Morton Firth Show. Today, my guest is Pete Turner, former Army combat spy, and today host of the Break It Down Show podcast. Well, you know, it's it's funny uh, in the field that I'm in, it's called counterintelligence, and so that's the job that they gave me. But when you read the job description, it's not very clear what you're going to do. During his service, Pete has over a thousand missions in conflict zones, including Bosnia, Iraq, and Afghanistan. And uh, we're gonna go do this thing and we're gonna be protected by the Afghans. Do you want to know about this or should I not tell you about it? You know, cause that, the person I'm talking to is responsible for responding and they'll say, I, I don't wanna know about this. Watch this interview as we talk about getting behind the enemy lines, using trust to build rapport. Pete, thank you so much for being a guest on my show, the Sonia Morton Firth Show. And Pete is joining us all the way over the water. Pete, tell me, where, where are you today? I live in Orange County, California, just sort of by Disneyland and Newport Beach, right in between those two things. So I've got uh, the happiest place in the world and probably the most perfect place in the world right down the road. Oh, my gosh. I am, I'd love to be anywhere near sea and water right now. Now, Pete, this isn't the first time we've met. I had the honor of being on your show a few weeks ago. And look, and I've even got my name at the back of your tent. That's fantastic. How great is that? <laughs> great, great. But look, t today is about you. And um, I, I, I really, really want to delve down into, um, into your background. Um, you, you were in the military uh, for, for most of your career. Um, and, and you had a special job in the military, but I think I'm just going to leave it there um, and just ask you, firstly, why the military? Why did you decide to join up? You know, I got a college degree in TV and radio broadcasting, and it was, um, it was impossible to find a job. I mean, we had a bit of a downturn in the economy at that time. And it, it, it's just one of those things where you have to know somebody. And I just, I could never figure it out. I couldn't put all the pieces together. And so I had to do something. I couldn't get a job because I didn't have any experience, but I couldn't get experience because, you know, I, I didn't have a job. Yeah, yeah. And so I finally, and I'd never considered the military. As a matter of fact, I looked down upon it. And one day I thought, you know, I got to do something different. I was pushing carts in the rain at Costco, if you guys know what Costco is. Yeah, yeah, I I thought, to, it's like our Tesco, or well, yeah, super big supermarket. Yep, yeah, giant boxes of cereal and everything. And I was pushing carts in the rain with a college degree and after months and months of looking and really no closer to a job. And I thought, I've got to do something. And, and so a guy had had a conversation with me. We were up early in the morning stocking shelves and he was in the same spot. And he's like, I think I might go join the military. And I thought, huh, well, you know, here, here it is. I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm pushing carts and, and now I think maybe I'm going to do it. And a month later I was in, I just, uh, you know, I give it a thought and I thought I'm, I'm going to do it. And wow. so I went in and, and they gave me a job and off Nothing I went. Like thought becomes things. Wow. That's, a, that's amazing. And, and, and it really had never crossed your mind. You haven't had a military, your family aren't, don't serve or anything like that. Yeah, I mean, we had a couple of people in our family that served, but it was in no way attractive to me. It was not at all part of my goal. Matter of fact, if it was, I could have planned it a whole lot better, you know, <laughs> but it really was something where I'm like, well, I need to pivot. And that was my, my pivot point. And I just went for it. And, and the guy who recruited me was great because he was basically done with his tour. I would think I was the last person he put in the military. And so I told him, I said, don't call me, don't bug me. Let me think about this for three weeks and then I'll let you know. And, and he did, he was great. He did everything he said he was going to do and he left me the hell alone. And I came back and said, let's do it. And, and so we did. And in your time at the military, you, you were actually a spy. That's how, how, how did that come across? I mean, did, did you actually just say, I want to be a spy <laughs> from here? <laughs> Well, you know, it's it's funny uh, in the field that I'm in, it's called counterintelligence. And so that's the job that they gave me. But when you read the job description, it's not very clear what you're going to do. And my recruiter was great. He's like, I've never put anybody in this job. I know that the higher numbers tend to be better jobs. And so you should take this job. I'm not sure what it is, but it's Intel. You're a smart guy. Uh, do this. And so in my field, there's a lot of things you can do. You might be a lie detector person. You might 
plant or look for bugs and things like that. You're looking to counter their espionage or surveillance or terrorism thing. There's all kinds of different facets of the job. And it just so happened that my my specialty became going out in combat zones and, and trying to find out what couldn't be found out by anybody else. So I, I spent a lot of time doing that. And, and I say spy, a lot of my peers don't like that. But the thing is, is it's not up to my peers what, what I do. If I'm out in Iraq and I'm running around trying to find things out, what do they think I am? And that's sort of the premise that I start with this. So sure, I'm an intelligence collector. Sure, I'm a human person, a counterintelligence. No one cares about that. When you're in an adversarial situation in a conflict zone, you know, they, they're just going to assume you're a spy. The person next to you is everybody's a spy because that's how that stuff goes. So I start from that point and just say, hey, look, this is what I'm doing. I'm here to find things out. Let me know if I'm bugging you and I won't do it anymore. I mean, and what was it like being in those? I mean, you mentioned you were in some of the, the, the hardest combat zones, the hot spots, really. What, what was it like when you were there and you were having to, to, to spy or to, to find out intelligence? It's pretty exciting and boring all at the same time. Sometimes it's, it's terrifying and other times it's, it's, it's uh, just a lot of fun. It's, it's life just in a very amplified form. So when you're in a place like Bosnia or Iraq or Afghanistan, you know, I'm protected by the people that I'm with, but I'm not always with those people. So I have to also be protected by something else. And so a lot of times it's my, it's my charm. It's my, it's my demeanor, you know, people that want, I want people to want to talk to me. And so that's sort of the person I become. And that makes it a lot of fun. If you were to, if you and I were to go out on patrols every day, you would say, all Pete does is goof around and talk to people. You know, that's not, he's not working. And that's exactly what I want. I want it to look like I'm having a great time. I'm talking to people, getting to know folks. And it looks like I'm basically goofing around because then when the information comes through my report, it blows people away because here I am having this crazy conversation about whatever laughing and, and, you know, even in like a place like a rock, I mean, being offered alcoholic drinks during Ramadan. I mean, that was a normal thing because I was able to create trust. So what it's like is uh, it's this puzzle that's unsolvable, but you're still trying to solve it all the time, looking at pieces, meeting people, trying to make information flow, testing systems, and just constantly learning about the environment that you're in so that you can communicate it back to the other environment, the, the military side. I mean, it sounds so interesting. I just want to take you back to something you just said there. And you said it was all about creating trust. And I mean, that, that is so important, I think, in anything, in anything we do, uh, whether that be, you know, in, in the military <laughs> as a spy or just generally um, with, in business and everyday life and relationships. I mean, how did you create that trust? Is there, is there a, did you have some tips on, on what, how you went about creating that, that sort of trust? Yeah, for sure. There, so one of the things that folks often say is you have to establish rapport and then you have to build trust. But that's it. That's like where the depth of knowledge stops. Well, how do I know when I have rapport? How do you establish it? How do you test it to make sure it's there? It's easy to think by coming in and go, hey, I'm Pete. How you doing? I'm from California. All right, we've got rapport. Let's move on to the next step. It doesn't work like that. It never does. It never has. I'm sure, especially in those combat zones, they were probably going to look at you and go, whoa. That's right. And, and so what I have a unique ability to do that I learned from a lot of mistakes. Okay, I'm not Superman. I, I just have made had the opportunity to make more mistakes than anybody else. But I'm able to take my, my internal camera off and then point it back towards myself and see who I am to the person that I'm with and try to understand who they are and where they come from. And so I don't try to impose my will upon them. I try to understand their their path. What are they doing what are their goals? How do they solve that? How do they get to this spot? Because, you know, there before the grace of God go I. So when I'm trying to establish rapport, I'm trying to be likable, affable. I'm trying to be me. I mean, that's the kind of guy I am. I'm, I'm a likable, fun guy. I, I wave at people. Hey, everybody, you know, I'm here. I'm Pete. How you doing? Uh, I also, because I don't put my needs before somebody else, I'll figure out like what is normal for them. And if I can accomplish my goal, 
through their normal path, then why wouldn't I do that? I mean, I'm in their country. I'm, I, they have a harder time surviving than I do. I've got food, I've got clothing, I've got shelter, I've got the military backing me. I've got all these advantages. So what is it like to be them? And then why do they make those decisions? And, and then what comes from that? Like what kind of state of mind does that put that in me? And can we, and can we evolve that? What's comfortable for them in terms of their evolution? Because all too often we come in as a, you know, a dominant Western force and we're just like, here's the problem with how you're living. Here's what you need to change. And, and that just doesn't create trust. That creates animus. It creates tension. It creates conflict. Even if they agree with you, you know, it's like getting your kids to do the thing that's good for them. How easy is that? <laughs> Definitely not. Um, I think mean, all of this um, culture must have come in a lot and then you know you're dealing with different cultures it wasn't just one culture i mean you mentioned bosnia iraq afghanistan all, all, all very very different cultures and, and and very different again to, to out to the western culture um how did you study the culture before you went in i mean the the ultimate truth is is no i, I don't do that i had to learn this far too often at least as americans and, and in the military we focus on how to not offend. And so I, I reject that entire premise. You know, culture is interesting. It's fascinating. You have to actually want to learn it. And so the ability to say, hey, this is going to be different. This is going to be uncomfortable. And what I call miscomfort. It's not, it's not uncomfortable. You just don't know what's comfortable like in this area. And you get it on, you try it out and you're like, oh, this actually isn't so bad. So what I do is I try to be curious. Do I amass knowledge before I go? Of course, you know, maybe I'll learn a phrase or two in their language, but more importantly, I just am curious and I let them know, like, I'm dying to know, like, how do you, how do you guys say hello here in this valley? Because I know in my hometown, you, we say it different than the people in the next town, the next town, next town. Like I, I'm from Northern California. We say the word hella a lot and hella can be an adjective and you can stack hella. So you can say, oh man, it's hella, hella cold outside. And that was like, let you know, it's <laughs> really cold. Yeah, you can even say it's hella, 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 three hellas, and it lets you know that wouldn't make any sense to anybody in Montana or London, you know, because it's different. So you ask these kind of questions, like, how do you guys describe how it's cold today? How do you guys say that? And this will be a very regional thing. And they'll be like, oh, yeah. So like in Baghdad, I'm like, man, it is a smoker today. How do you guys talk about like, it's impressively hot. And the guy says, you say, Yom Aswad black day it's a black day today and so i could now use this thing to my advantage you know i could say is today y'all mass water is it not hot enough yet you know and then they would they would get a kick out of that because i got who they were but i didn't do that by reading in a book i did it by engaging with people with my partners and asking questions that that they're just compelled to answer did you ever find yourself in any sort of sticky spots or in any uh, I'd say dangerous situation. I guess the whole situation was dangerous anyway because of where you were, but in a, any place where you felt that your life was maybe in danger. Yeah, I mean, the whole thing is dangerous. I mean, that's just the truth. You have to realize that you're in an adversarial position where people are clinging to stability uh, with their fingertips. And, and you might be the person just through luck or, or by design that they come after. Everywhere I've been, there's been reports on how do, who is this guy? And they'll say my name. And I use my name because I, I want to be genuine to put the people I'm interacting with. And so they'll say, how do we find out about this guy, Pete? How do we kill this guy, Pete? How do we capture this guy, Pete? And sure, that, that's, that's dangerous. And were you in military clothing or did you always do that? Sometimes, sometimes, but usually, usually I was in some kind of modified military clothing or something very obviously American. You know, a lot of times I wore a ball cap, I'd have a helmet on, some body armor, and then a, a t-shirt because it's usually hot where I was. And then, uh, you know, a comfortable pair of, of pants that, you know, like cargo pants or something. So I always had extra pockets to carry things, that kind of thing. So I definitely look like an American. I'm not trying to, the thing is the, what I have to do, I have to do overtly. I can't hide behind covers and, and legends and those kind of stories. That's not the kind of spying I did. I had to collect in right in front of people's faces. And there's really not a lot of time for all that other stuff. And again, it's disingenuous. So if, if I'm in one part of the province talking to someone, I need to be the same person all the way across on the other side of the province. You know, Maybe they meet me in a military setting with the Americans where yeah. I am Pete. 
So if I have a cover story, you know, now I have to lie to the Americans the entire time. And it's not lie, it's a cover story. I don't want to do all that. I want to simplify and just be the good dude that I am so that I'm likable. And so that when, when the, when the Taliban calls a meeting that they want the Afghans to bring me to, they meet me and they go, Oh, that guy's cool. Yeah. You guys can talk to him. He's all right. Were you used in those situations? I I want to say negotiations, maybe that is the right word, but um, in, in talks where they trusted you and wanted you there. Yeah. Yes. The answer to that question is, is yes, but not, maybe not the way you might expect. So there was, uh, and this was a published story. You can look this up. There was a multi-decade, multi-generational conflict in the Valley that I was in in Afghanistan. And because I had built up trust with the local government leader there, and he knew that I wasn't going to try to jump into his situation or muddy the waters or impose myself. Um, he said, he revealed to me, he's like, I've been busy these last few nights. I know you've seen that I've had a lot of people come in. I'm working on a very big project. I'm trying to resolve this 50 to 70 year old dispute between these families that's caused a lot of problems in this valley. You guys wouldn't know about it because we wouldn't talk about it. It's nothing you could understand. And so then I talked to him, I'm like, we have a thing called the Hatfields and McCoys here in America. And he's like, yeah, it's like that where everybody kind of forgets why they're mad at each other. They just know they hate each other. And I'm trying to eliminate that. And I said, what can I do to, to observe or whatever to help? And he's like, yeah, I don't want you around right now. But when we get right to the end, I want you to come in and capture this so you can learn about how we do these things. And so that's sort of where, where it is that, I, you know, that, that I'm able to help with negotiation is by staying out of the way. I can now communicate this back to us on our side and say, hey, they're doing this. They don't need any of our help, but we should know this is happening because this is a big win for us. The, the thing about that is, is, is if I don't spend time talking with the American side, that's where all of my attention has to be. If I can't get us to calm down and do less and get it right more often, then, then I'm not able to do my job out in the field effectively. So I've got to balance the equation where I'm, I'm spending enough time with us to get us to calm down, slow down, get better so that we can actually hit the mark with this other side because they don't want us interfering with their stuff any more than anybody else does we just got to find the spots where we can actually create value within their norms wow wow i mean it it, it sounds it sounds complicated but at the same time, <laughs> it is <laughs> i mean what did you find the most challenging of the role i guess Honestly, the most challenging thing is getting us to get out of our way. I would go on a, a, a patrol and I, I, I have a sense for these things now. I've built it. If it's just through trial and error. So I would go on a patrol with an element. And let's say this element was involved with um, improving, oh, I don't know, let's say agriculture. And the Americans that were there trying to improve agriculture would have their mission. They would go out and they would do a great job and they would brief that to the commander. I would come back and say, I talked to this guy over here on the side and he laughed at this whole entire project. And he said, we've done this for 10 years. We all know how to inoculate our goats. We appreciate the shots, but uh, nothing you guys did here is any different than what's been done for the last 10 years. And so I take that back to the commander and say, here we go. You know, like we have this intent of creating this thing. We'd already created it. We just haven't moved past square one. How do we improve? Okay. Yeah. They know goats. They want to inoculate them. Great. You've done that, but that's all you've done. You haven't improved the community. You haven't created stability. You've just done this one thing, but what you've briefed back to yourself is all of this wonderful stuff that's happened. It's not in any way impressive to do the same thing you've done 10 times over and over. They get it. But unless we know that, and then we ask the question, well, how do we do better at this? Then, then we're stuck in this really beginner form of creating stability and we haven't advanced at all. So did you find part of your job then or part of your role just as much gaining uh, trust uh, with the locals as well as your own, as well as the, the American military, as well as your own command, the command, chain of command? Yeah, abs absolutely. I mean, and, and this is sort of the point of the last story is I would, write this report and then the person who wrote the report where we really knocked it out of the park we did a great job they would read my report and they would attack my findings you know and i'm like hey listen you can attack my analysis but i actually had this conversation i actually talked to this person you're attacking a reality that you can't attack and these are their younger ranking guys that perception of something that's not actually reality Right, right. And so if you can't accept reality, you can't really attack my analysis either, because we're not talking about the same thing. 
those are younger ranking guys typically sometimes they're older guys who hadn't had enough experience and i shouldn't say younger i should say less experienced than being out in the field because it's really easy to think you're doing a great job but if you come in with the point of view of how is this impacting the people i'm there for and i'll give you an example of this if we go out to a school we're desperate to get girls into school and into education and we say we're coming down we're going to take a look at these schools that we've built we want to see how many kids are there well they'll perform that for us they'll go out and they'll do what's called a satisfying behavior and they're like yeah 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 the americans are coming let's bring all our kids down well pete will go the next day yeah 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 <laughs> and then i'll be like by the way that mission where, where are all the children where are all the girls <laughs> <laughs> Now it's, now it's a coffee house, you know? Yeah. So, and as a commander, you're desperate to know this stuff, but you can't know it unless you have someone like me. Now I can, I can literally walk off the camp. Now I, I typically try to, I don't put myself into any more danger than I absolutely have to, but sometimes you have to accept a lot of risk to do this job well. So when I'm like, Hey, I'm going to, I'll tell the army and this is hundred percent true. Like I'll go to them and I'll say, I'm about to go into, into the space and uh, a combat zone. And I'm going to be solo or with a partner and we're going to go do this thing and we're going to be protected by the Afghans. Do you want to know about this or should I not tell you about it? You know, because that the person I'm talking to is responsible for responding and they'll say, I, I don't want to know about this, but I want you to take a radio and make sure, you know, and then I'll understand what's going on. So I've not told them about it because that ability to get that information that next day from that school or a week later from that school is so valuable. And they, they know that I know what I'm doing. And really, ultimately, that sounds dangerous, but I'm doing, I'm, I'm, but I'm really just walking around town. You know, I mean, just like the Afghans are doing. And so if my Afghan partner, you know, a government official, an elder says, you'll be safe with me, then that has to be good enough. I, I can't insult that promise. You know, are you ever totally safe? No, of course not. But if that person says that, then I can go out and get that piece of information that nobody else can get by exposing myself. I don't do it often and I do it by design, but that but that elevated risk is part of what my job is. And it's part of what nobody else can do and shouldn't do. I mean, what I'm doing is I'm very fortunate to still be alive, but I also am very good at what I do. It's like looking at someone who plays, um, you know, football in England in, at the Premier League level. You can't do what they do. So I got extraordinarily good at this and people will say, ah, oh, you know, whatever, who, who, what's Pete talking about? Trust me. I, <laughs> I know when I see levels of collection that are below where I'm at, because I've made those mistakes. I recognize the mistakes that they're making and you can point them out, but egos get in the way. So when I'm doing this, I'm doing this at the expert level and it's remarkable the things that you get and then the new insights that you gain. And every time I get these new insights, you know, I'm further and further and further ahead of my peers because I get it faster because I don't, it isn't about me. It's about what my, what my partner, what my, my person I'm working with, the source of information, it's about their ability to trust me <clears throat> and expose me to things that they wouldn't take, wouldn't dare to expose other Americans to because it's too problematic for them. I guess it all comes back down to what you said at the beginning, trust, getting that trust level up. Um, but walking in there knowing you, you could make like one slight slip up, right? And, and, and you know, that they could take you in, I guess, detain you, whatever, or, or decide that you are a threat to them and, and not to be trusted. Um, did that sort of cross your mind as you were walking into those uh, situations? I mean, it crosses your mind when you assess the risk, right? When you're trying to decide, is this worth doing? And, you know, that's why you go talk to the army. You're like, here's what I'm going to do. And they're like, we don't want you to do that. However, if you're going to do it, let's do it this way. So I've already assessed the risk and accepted it at this point. And so I no longer can focus on it because my focus has to be in other places. Could I make a mistake? Yes. Do I make mistakes? Yes, but they're not that level of mistake. So I'm there and I know that my best thing is just simply staying out of the way. Don't muck up the works. And it's a lot easier to be in that room. Ask questions that are smart. Take your time. Listen, try to understand folks. And it's a whole lot easier to have you sit in a room that no other American can be in because I'm not causing them any. Look, these are important, influential people that I'm talking with, right? And so how would you do that in England? How would you do that here in America? Would you, would you come in and, and be blusterful and, and, and interrupt everything? And how about this? The military, State Department too, from the American side, 
we love to go unannounced and just crash someone's calendar and show up. Hey, we're here. You're going to need to feed us. You're going to need to spend five hours with us. You can't make us leave because we have guns. Well, Jesus. <laughs> That's yeah, it's terrible. Like, like gay crashing a party and expecting a good reception, right? Yeah, like, yeah, with guns. You ain't got an invite. <laughs> crashing that party with guns, too. So yeah. I did my best. I, I would just simply say, like, we would have these perceptions of these uh, Afghan leaders, and, and we would say, oh, this person's a basket case. That's an actual word, basket case. And so I'm like, oh, that's a problem. Let me go look into this. And so I go and I, I sat a meeting with this basket case and i'm like hey let's go see this guy so we go see him and he's like i'll come get you guys and uh, no worries we'll come down to my office and we'll talk i'm kind of busy though i got a lot going on and so i write this report my, my partner rich and i totally different than what everybody else had seen from this guy and and you're welcome to challenge it but you weren't in the room you didn't have this conversation and we've been invited back to have more conversations and to see more of his plan and by simply taking the time to do that the commander now goes yeah, what you guys are saying over there isn't right. Pete, Pete is getting to something that I don't have enough of. Let's see who else he can meet. And then here's here's another thing that I did. And this is, again, next level uh, collection. I would bring the important Afghans or Iraqis onto my camp. And I would let them go into the uh, dining facility and eat whatever they want. You want ice cream? You want to have make you something? Let's get you a sandwich. What do you want? What do you want to take home for your kids? And instead of us always eating their food, I let them have access to ours and, and treated them like the VIP that they were. And so they would come on the camp. They're like, yeah, hey, who else should I meet? Who else is influential like you that I should know? And they're like, oh, you got to meet Bob. Bob's the best. And so I would, I would have Bob in there. No one's even met Bob. I would look, there's no card on Bob. I don't know who Bob is, but I'm going to get a picture next to him. We're going to meet this guy who's apparently terribly important. And then the commander will walk through the, the dining facility and be like, who the hell is Pete talking to, yeah. you know? And so, and he doesn't care that I'm feeding this person. He cares like Pete's an asset because he's bringing people to the, our place and meeting them on our terms. And this is totally different. I don't know anybody else. And I, I would say like, no one else has met this guy. No, maybe he's nobody, but in this first meeting, his phone rang 25 times and my interpreter was listening to their conversation. It was all tribal stuff. So here's a tribal elder we've never met. Why is that? Just listening to what you're saying, do you think there are ways that the military could improve their way of doing this um, or sort of taking on this approach rather than sort of going in all guns are blazing? Yeah, we have to. I mean, if we're going, this is what modern conflict looks like. I mean, if you think about like, okay, the Americans and the Brits and the Canadians and the New Zealanders and, and the Aussies, they're all coming. Well, we're not going to beat them in a fight toe to toe. So how else can we fight? I mean, what that's what obviously what you would do. And what they're better at than us is affect. We can create a desired response to stimuli. We just think in terms of the things that we do. And the example I always use is if I wrote 15 love letters to a girl, it doesn't mean that she's in love with me now because I wrote 15 of them. It's, it's the affect. That's what matters. Can I create the response that I thought? And even if it's, if it's the response adjacent. Now I can work with that. They do that much better than we do. So we have to do these things. And, and there's elemental things that we miss as, and, and this applies to regular life. There's elemental things that we miss that we don't even understand. So the military will train on military, you know, seek and destroy, close with and, and kill, all these kind of, of skill sets. And that's vital that the military does that. But they, there's no specific doctrine on how to work an interpreter. You know, they can they can lay down a new recruit and teach them how to shoot and, and hit the middle of the target over and over again within a week, two weeks. You know, maybe some people need more, but there's an institutional knowledge on how to do that. Not with an interpreter. You know, we start with mistrust of our own asset. We don't trust our own asset enough to really put them to work. And then uh, here's, here's another secret. This is where, like, you get next level stuff again. Any interpreter I work with, if they're doing a great job, I let their employer know. You know, whoever the contract holder is or, or whoever, whoever's their boss. And I say, hey, this person is doing a great job. I'm pushing the heck out of them and they're holding up. They deserve a raise. What do we, how do we go about doing that? Who do you need letters from? Let's get this person more money because they're invaluable. I mean, I can't even tell you how. And so just think about that. And now ask anybody else who's deployed in the last 20 years, how many times they got their interpreter a raise? And it's not going to be many. And yeah, it's a, it's a dangerous job as well, right? You're standing there. <laughs> front of the, the enemy um, translating something that could potentially be very 
uh, can have massive consequences. It's, oh. it's so, so dangerous. I mean, many of these guys have to wear masks because they're going to stay in their home country and they have to protect their identity. Every day, their families are moving around trying to avoid being attacked or whatever. I mean, just the, just the association with the Americans a lot of times is lethal for these people and the, for the people that they love. They're, they're under extreme stress, duress, danger. If I got PTSD from being there, what do they have? from being there all the time. Yes, hyper dangerous. And then we don't trust them. We, we can't find it around them to get them an extra hundred bucks a month. You know, it's just, it's, uh, that's what you need to know about. Like, why, why do we struggle? Because we get the basic things, but we can't even have a conversation in a way that makes sense because we refuse to learn how to use interpreters at the advanced level. Communication is, is so key, it's so vital. Um, you just mentioned PTSD. Did, did you, have you suffered? Do you suffer from PTSD? Yeah, I, I do. I mean, I worked, I worked outside the camp so much and probably more than anybody you're going to encounter. You know, I just, my response, my natural response has become something else. And I have to work to slow down to really measure how I react emotionally or to let my emotions wash out. So, yeah, I mean, I, you know, and I don't mind talking about it because the, the person who's not in as good a shape as I am in terms of mentally, you know, I want them to understand they can get there, but I, I have suicidal ideation every day. It doesn't mean I'm going to act on it, but I have that compulsion and I, you know, I'll have a, a hit of depression every day that I have to deal with and you have to build the tools and you can build the tools, but yeah, I mean, every day, that's part of the cost. When did you sort of um have those feelings or those thoughts when you left the, when you'd left the military or what were you still there a lot of it presented itself after i got back i mean ultimately i was fine with the day-to-day -day activity but i need i really needed to reintegrate into society and just my my natural chemical response to things was way out of whack because where i lived was way out of whack with reality so some of those things were present and i didn't realize them but a lot of it was because when i came back after doing all of this high level work uh, i couldn't find a job nobody would employ me i couldn't find a job in any kind of corporate america i couldn't find a job in government no one would hire me no one would even interview me so it's um it's a huge smash to your well-being if you become unmoored emotionally professionally i mean at some point you don't have enough guy wires to keep your life in any kind of semblance of order do you and, get, um, I mean, here here in in the uk and and you know I'm, I'm not in the military but i've interviewed a lot of veterans um our vets don't get a lot of help in terms of transitioning into civilian like civilian life i mean the government have a have a program but it's not intensive and, and it certainly doesn't really guarantee veterans a job that's for sure and in fact there are a lot of veterans that do end up homeless here um, or, or just struggle to sort of make that transition to transitioning their skills that they've had in the military over to sort of civilian language i mean isn't there help i i, I what i've heard um is there is more help in the us but but it sounds like you, you didn't get any help I mean, I, I, I can't say that I had a lot of help. I also wasn't in a position to accept help a lot of times, okay. you know, to be, to be fair to everybody. And, and you have to understand, there's people that are desperate to help veterans. I didn't even believe that for a while. Think about that. I, I was like, nope, people here hate, hate veterans. I can tell because I've got this terrible existence. And so I was convincing myself of it. But when you, when you look at what I've done, what I've just described, right? Very high level work. I'm changing the, the point of direction of an organization of 5,000 or more people, getting them to completely reorient, but just with myself and a partner, maybe just myself and an interpreter, fantastic changes for the better, improving how they do things. And then people would say, well, what can you do here? And I'm like, oh my God, you know, you want to talk about culture, you want to talk about your internal impact on people, external, all day long, I could do things, but you have to, you have to talk to me. And so of all the all the resumes I put out when I first came back, and I did over a thousand, in part because I've been on a thousand um, combat missions. I, I received no, no real interviews. I had two interviews that were set up by friends. One person said, go back to Afghanistan. The other person said, I can't afford you before they even asked me what I might want for, for money. So you think about that. I can go out and I can apply for a thousand things and I can't even get a call back. How valuable would I feel after that? I mean, after all the impact that I'd had, after all the danger that I'd taken on, after getting the Taliban to, to sign off on my presence in the Valley, 
and nobody can find a thing for me to do? You Come give on. them any sort of counseling or um, uh, talk like, like people that would help you through sort of um, PTSD or your, your, the issues that you were going through with this feeling of not feeling so it's self worth, basically. Yeah, I mean, being being obsolete, ignored, it makes it's hard to want to stay alive in those cases. So yeah, and there's counseling. I mean, I you know, I, my my I deal with my PTSD through a lot of therapy and counseling, and and it, it's worked. It's helped me. I'm mean, I'm not better, but I'm able to manage it. I can recognize it sooner. I can start to create take my corrective actions, or know that I can weather this, and it'll be over in about ninety minutes or so. You know, I've I've gotten a real pattern for it. I still have to deal with it, but you know that that's life. Finding the right kind of help for you professionally, though, is very hard because most of the places that are out there, they don't have the ability to create a, a customized um, team or a response for someone who has a lot of experience. So if you're a military member, and you come out with 12, 15 years experience, who, who's going to be able to adapt to all the things? It's not the things that like translating skills. It's I have so many skills. I've done so many things. Where would you like me to go? You know, like, what, what can I not do after this point? But it's not often seen that way. So we struggle to, the thing I always needed was, I don't need you to tell me how to get a job or write a resume. I've got all that stuff covered. What I need are you to open some doors for me and say, hey, we got a great guy. We'd love you to interview him. You know, see if he's valuable in your, in your organization. But you, you can't. They want you to go through this, you know, front door solution with resumes. And it just doesn't, it's not an impactful way to do it for someone that has a lot of really fantastic experience. I mean, I, I don't know what credential I would need to be more qualified. I've got master's degree, I've got fantastic experience, mm -hmm. but I can't even get an interview. The problem is not my skills. This problem is not translating my skills. It's the fact that no one will talk to me. Wow, Pete. And so you start your show and you talk to so many different other people. Tell me a little bit about your show, the Break It Down show. So that's where we <laughs> met yes. um, and, and sort of what gave you the idea for that and, and how actually, which is I find fascinating is how your skills translate beautifully um, into interviewing people. Yeah, I mean, it's good. I'm glad we're changing gears from the heavy stuff and getting into some fun stuff. The Break It Down show is my show. I created it. One of the things I knew when I stopped working in combat zones in 2012 was I didn't want to try to, I didn't want to do that anymore. I was burning my life up. I was uh, not seeing my daughter enough and I just wanted to start living again. And so I came back and, and, you know, I became ultimately because I couldn't get a job. I had to make money. I, I became a handyman. I'm not handy at all. You know, I mean, I can fix some things here and there, but what I was You're great a communicator, at communicator, right? You're a communicator. Yeah. Well, this is what I'm about to say. Like, I was a great handyman because I would get one of my friends whose life was in crisis. He's like, I need a job. I'm getting divorced, whatever. I'm like, well, come on. And if they could fix stuff, I would deal with the wife, the office manager, whoever it was, and be like, I want you to worry about anything else but this. I've got this. It's done. If there's a problem, I'll let you know. Otherwise, go enjoy doing something else. And they love that. They love that I took them. I mean, think about helping someone move. I'm built to move things. I carry stuff all day long. I show up and I'm like, don't ever, I've moved so many people. Do not worry. I will get this couch in that door. And if I can't, you'll know about it, but I'm going to get this couch in this door, you know? So that's, that's what I ended up doing. And then as that happened, uh, my, my partner, John and I, who co-founded Break It Down Show with me, we started doing a, a, a small community radio show. And then they quickly said, you guys are too good. Get out of here. Go do something bigger rethink the whole thing and get way bigger and so that's what the break it down show became and it's been it's been Sonia it's been crazy I mean we've met so many and you know you know this I mean I've met so many incredible people where if I would have told myself you know eight years ago right before I started this whole thing I said hey you're about to go on this ride where you're going to meet all these people it's incredible my network has completely exploded the people that I know and how passionate they are and how great they are and how giving they are it's incredible and then the people that love the show same thing so many of my very good friends now are, are from the break it down show because they get what I do and you're right I'm using my spy skills every day when I run my show I'm writing reports I'm meeting new people I'm engaging and I know how to ask questions as good as anybody ever has I mean I've, I've had the compliment of people saying I've been interviewed by a lot of people, thousands of people, and it's you and 
whatever, Dave Letterman, or you and Larry King, or you and somebody else, you guys are at the top. You made me go to places I had never been to before as an interview. And so, you know, that that's that's one of the benefits of, of running around and getting shot at and blown up for, for years and years is that I know how to ask questions of people and get them to get past the normal thing and get you something that you're not going to get on other shows. And that's, that's really what I try to do. And, and really what my show is, is it's a patrol. I meet someone, I have a conversation that'll blow my mind. And then I share that with you guys. It's fantastic. And what do you, where do you see the, where do you see the future, the vision? Have you got a big vision for where you want to take the show? Yeah, I mean, obviously, there's the day to day stuff, you got to make enough money to survive. So I do that by helping other people, you know, realize their vision, get their show going. I, one of the things I do is I, I teach people how to ask questions, you know, how, to, how do you, it's one thing to say, this is how you start a podcast, but how do you host it? How do you become a good host, ask the right kind of questions to give your audience something unique? And I, 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 I do that. And I train people on how to do that. Yeah, the other thing is, is uh, the big vision is to get in front of because I'm in Southern California to try to get in with these bigger production places like Amazon and Disney, that kind of thing, and just start to help create the content. That's like the secondary content. So if you're going to have a, a movie or a documentary, let's get that stuff you can't use or you don't even think to use and let's create content with that. And that's that's the direction that I'm going is, is to be able to create. I guess you would call it auxiliary content or just give people who love what you did, give them more and, and do it with a, a podcast form, whether it's video or audio or whatever, and then just create some more um, original. Uh, there are so many wonderful stories that just never get told. I mean, I'm in a town full of stories and 1%, 2% of them get told. Now imagine if you're able to take that story and, and give it some life and then maybe it gets taken to an even bigger level. So there's a lot of room for the podcast world to augment and, and highlight things that can't be highlighted. I, I completely agree. And storytelling, as you say, is the way forward. You know, it's, it, it's I think the, the selling a business the old traditional way is long gone. Um, and people are much more into the story of a brand or a bit. I mean, we think of Amazon, you know, it's got such a story behind it. Well, and how do we tell that story? And what better way of telling a story than communicating and having a conversation, right? Over a cup of tea or whatever, over a podcast, a chat, where you are, are, are getting the sound bites, the, the relevant sound bites of that business. Great, great idea, Pete. Um, if you look back um, now on your military career can you see how it's benefited you today or where it's benefited you today yeah i mean for sure you know the experiences i've had the one thing i don't lack for is experience and and, and uh an opportunity to solve and work on very hard, hard problems and that's caused me to grow tremendously it's caused me to understand my ego and how it undermines my success and so I can control that. It's been it's been a fantastic journey. It's been hard, but all journeys are hard. I mean, that's the whole point of the journey, right? Is to go out and and see what happens. So my life has been an adventure, and it continues to be an adventure. I just have to be able to withstand uh, the challenges that come at it. But again, no one gets a free ride. Everyone has problems. It's just you know, it's a matter of just being able to manage it. So yeah, my military career has been fantastic. I I love it. It's great. I'm constantly meeting new people. Why would I want to change that? And I know you do a lot of help as well with the veteran community. Tell me a little bit more about that. I know you're, you're quite involved there. Yeah. Uh, so my, my charity is called Save the Brave, and uh, I'm sort of the media arm of it. You know, there's a lot of folks involved, and, and we're a growing charity. We've, we've conquered a lot of the basic you know, early stage problems, and we're working on bigger problems, you know, bigger organizational, not problems, but challenges. And so Save the Brave, we work on folks with PTSD, and we try to get veterans together. And look, we use fishing as like our, our primary way of, of dealing with this and putting people on a boat. But the, but the God's honest truth is, is we get people involved, you know, and in, in, in service of one another, or, you know, connected and just checking in on each other. And it's just a lot more, I mean, fishing looks fun and everything else, but day to day, when you knock down again on a boat, what do you do? You, you call each other, you look in on one another and, and we create this community and we like, how do we find someone we can help? And if you're, if you're busy doing those things, you know, it's, it's hard to not get a tremendous value back. I, I push anybody who's an adult who has a, a somewhat stable life, you know, you need to work on some kind of charity thing. And by the way, charity is not easy, not supposed to be easy. These aren't supposed to be easy problems, Wh whatever it is that you're into saving the ocean, uh, curing dog cancer, it doesn't matter. They're all important things. 
you know, it needs your help. You don't have to start a new charity either, by the way. Just yeah. go find one that does what you do. Support other people's charities. Absolutely. Right. Well, yeah, we'll, put, we'll put that in the show notes as well so people can go and, thank you. I mean, supporting veterans with PTSD is very close to my heart. And, um, you know, if, there, if there's any anything that I can do as well or put you in contact um, with my network as well of veterans over here, then, then I'd love to do that, Pete. Pete, just closing up, because I have a final question that I ask all my guests. Um, and that is, if you were to write a message in a bottle for future generations to find, what would that message be? My message in a bottle is the common, uh, the common advice I give to everybody is slow down. Just slow down and appreciate what's there slow down and, and just look around and, and take a moment i mean if you're in a panicked moment and and you're hyped up and you're, and you're going crazy that's a good time to go i can slow down i can do this I mean, you can always speed up just try to slow down so that you enjoy more so things aren't as crisis ridden as you might think that they are slow down i mean that's what i've had to learn how to do just slow down i love that pete Thank you so much for being on the Sonny Morton Third Show. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed the show. Remember, there's a new interview out every Monday. So hit subscribe and like, and you'll get it straight into your inbox.